Jeff, welcome. Why don't we just start with Chase uh, and, and take us through what you see there. Is it as bad as these numbers suggest, or are there are good signs in there? And number two, what does it imply for the other banks that will report later this week? I, uh, good, good afternoon. No, I, I do not think it's as bad as the market's reaction implies. I think if you look at the results, the earnings were actually pretty good. What I think some of the concerns have come to is more on the capital side with some of the markdowns from higher interest rates on their security portfolio, that their, their capital levels looked a little more challenged. But when I kind of take a step back, <clears throat> trading was quite a bit better than, than feared. Investment banking was weak, which we kind of expected. <clears throat> they took, they put up more credit reserves than, than I, I was certainly expecting, but I think more than anybody was expecting. But the important thing here is the driver of that was more just a reaction to the macro environment, right? Uh, under kind of CECL accounting, they increase the probability that there might be, you know, some kind of an economic problem coming. It's not really driven by actual problems or cracks in the underlying credit environment, which I think is important. And part of the reason banks in general are holding up pretty well today is when we first saw that reserve, the thought was, ooh, or, you know, is credit turning? Uh, this, this seems more a, a level of, of kind of being cautious. I think once the smoke clears, uh, people will kind of look at J.P. Morgan and maybe view these numbers better, and the stock will hopefully recover. So. Yeah, so the, so the credit reserves was really a question of prudence, given the economic uh, situation, the global situation as well. How much is Ukraine, how much are the Russia sanctions playing with this bank, uh, this bank's numbers, and how will they affect some of those other banks, most notably perhaps Citi? You know, the, the direct impact, I think, it has been pretty modest. I mean, you saw, I think, J.P. Morgan took $524 million, which is a big number for you or I, but not so much for J.P. Morgan, of kind of write downs from credit spreads and exposures there. But the, the place where I think the, it becomes more of a concern is other counterparties. What does it mean for Europe as far as a recession goes? Kind of mm -hmm. one of the, the second or third level uh, impacts. Citigroup certainly the most exposed of the U.S. banks. But even if you look at Citigroup, I mean, $10 billion of exposure on their balance sheet isn't a whole lot. It will be interesting to see what they do tomorrow as far as uh, marks go. But I think when, when we kind of look at capital, certainly if we saw from J.P. Morgan today, the capital ratio took a hit, but they're still not looking bad. And I think they still leave plenty of room for buybacks. I expect it'll be the same thing from Citigroup tomorrow, but we'll have to kind of see how it plays out. You said that one of the non-surprises was that deal revenue was not uh, particularly good. And I think you're exactly right. We, we had no reason to believe it would be. But as we turn to Thursday tomorrow and Goldman Sachs and Morgan Stanley, uh, will that fact, the fact that deals uh, have not been all that robust this, this past quarter, uh, will that affect them more? Relatively speaking, it's just a bigger part of their business. Yep. But really, as you said, Investment banking, we knew it would be challenged. M&A was actually pretty good. Uh, there's a pipeline of stuff to get closed. It's really equity underwriting and, to a lesser extent, debt that, that's been challenged. Uh, but for Morgan Stanley and Goldman tomorrow, the good news from today's reports were trading was much better than we expected. I mean, you know, we're talking the, the year over year declines were, you know, half what we were fearful they would be. Uh, you know, unless J.P. Morgan is just really a standout this quarter, the implication would be, other firms like Goldman and Morgan Stanley that have big trading books as well should should have you know better results than, than we were maybe fearing uh, when they report tomorrow. Do you have a favorite in this group and a favorite to avoid? Yeah, I mean, I, I think when I look at the group, I still like Bank of America here, BAC, partially because they're less exposed in capital markets. So that gives them a little tailwind, but also interest rates help them and they've got scale like no one else. So in a tougher inflationary expense environment, they can really take advantage of there. I also like Goldman Sachs here. Uh, capital markets outlook is certainly tougher than it was six weeks ago, but it may not be as tough as kind of the fears out there are. And I think Goldman's valuation is actually pretty attractive with how much it's beaten down. So those are kind of the, the two I'd be looking at.